Hello and welcome to this photo speed YouTube video with me, Tim Jones. And today I have the esteemed pleasure of being with Paul Saunders in his studio here. <laughs> studio, it's a shed. Shed. Yeah, to be realistic, yeah. it's a shed. <laughs> but we've got all these lovely books and things behind us as well. We can't really show you over here because it's um, it's all lo lots and things, but we will do a little bit of a pan round, I'm afraid, Paul, to show you all. Okay, I wish I'd tied it up now. <laughs> but today we're going to be, well, we're actually filming two videos today, but it'll come out kind of in time but the first one we're going to record which today is about Paul's background and work and we did do I think me and Sam we did do a kind of a zoom thing in lockdown didn't we, we did we yes. talked yeah, about we did. your work yeah. and where you came from and things like that and showed you yeah. the pictures as well but that was a good few years ago now it was so we thought yeah. it'd be well I thought it'd be really good to kind of pop in and see you on my way back from somewhere yeah. and have a nice. chat. Nice and... to have you here. Nice to give you a cup of no. coffee. Yeah, no, thank you very much. Much needed this morning. <laughs> Those of you who don't know, Paul is actually a Photospeed ambassador and has printed for many years, haven't you, Paul? Yes. You've... Yeah. We, we will show you Colin, don't worry. I know you're all itching to see Paul's printer over in the corner, yeah. so we will. <laughs> we will introduce Colin, Colin. just out of shot, he's shy. <laughs> <laughs> because he's the main reason we're here, really. Paul's just the kind of facilitator for it. Yeah, yeah. I'm <laughs> effectively Colin the printer's agent. A little bit of housekeeping to start with. Don't forget to subscribe to the Photospeed YouTube channel. Also give us a little bit of a thumbs up and things. And also head over to photospeed.com to sign up to our newsletter to get all the latest news and bits and all that. So that's a little bit of housekeeping out of the way. So let's have a chat with Paul. So let's start by talking a little bit about, I suppose, your background and yeah. just kind of how... How you've got to where you are at the minute? I know that could be quite a long answer, but I'll kind of keep, I'll keep it. I'll keep it short. So, <laughs> yeah. um, I think I've got to where I am now uh, by a series of happy accidents and luck, and a bit of hard work as well. Um, not being sort of flippant about it, um, my my main background is news photography, um, but my my journey in photography began as a, a sort of fashion and glamour uh, okay. photographer shooting calendars in Spain. Um, Did you so, do a Pirelli one? Or was it? No, no, we were never high profile <laughs> enough to do Pirelli. Okay. Um, but it was a really good grounding in, because we were shooting on film, everything was transparency. So it was a really good grounding in exposure control, contrast control, um, you know, shoot management, things like that. And... I loved it because it, it was, you know, the reason I got into photography originally was because it was cool mm. and I wanted to meet pretty girls. So a cool job and meeting pretty girls. It was mm. great fun. Uh, but when I moved, when I came back home, I really needed to get a proper job. So I got into news and I, I got a buzz out of seeing my work in print. There's something really special about seeing somebody look at a photograph that you've taken and it hold their attention in a newspaper, a complete stranger. It's lovely when you, you produce a print and you take it in and your partner says, oh, that's really beautiful. But when you see your work held up on the news, you know, if it's on TV or whether you see somebody on the train reading a newspaper with your work, the, the buzz is incredible and it's addictive. Mm. You know, you always want to get the, the, the next the next front page or the next big show in the paper. Um, and I, I love that buzz. Uh, I was hooked on it. I mean, I was completely addicted to it. Um, and it's it's quite different to the world that I inhabit now. Mm. Um, you know, it's much, much slower. Um, but I think that news, the newspaper world for me was a very good training ground. It was a place I could cut my teeth. The problem I had was I was never shooting for myself. Mm. You're always photographing what somebody else wants to a deadline that somebody else has set. I suppose generally problem solving as well. I know lot of, yeah. in that done work in the past. And yeah, like a lot of problem, mm. lot of problem solving, a lot of making um, a silk purse out of a sow's ear, um, because often, and having been a picture editor as well, it's very easy to sit at a desk completely remote from somewhere and say, this is the picture I've got in my head. And then you as the photographer on the ground have got to somehow create that out of a man with a large check. Yes. <laughs> yeah. like, I don't want a big check. <laughs> I need I need you doing whatever it was that you were, were doing. Well, no, we've got this, we've got this big check from the bank and 
but big checks aren't, you know. But my, my first editor had a mantra that faces sell papers. Yes. So every time a person was in the paper, they would buy the paper. And that's true. They would also buy a print. Um, the second editor I had, he said that art sells papers, interesting pictures that will make mm. people look with curiosity and wonder what it's about. So that was a complete shift. Yeah. And when I was working for agencies, you were always thinking with a different hat on, depending on which magazine you were shooting for or which newspaper you were shooting for. Um, you know, So it was really challenging. It taught you to shoot around your subject. It taught you to not take it for granted that the picture that was in front of you was that the picture would make, that's the picture that would make. Mm. Sometimes you had to think very laterally to tell the story. And it was very important to understand why you were making the picture. You know, what was the story? What was the, what was the subtle detail that the journalist was going to bring out of that story that hadn't quite been revealed yet? So only by understanding why you were there were you able to pick up on the subtleties um, and that goes for everything from, you know, sort of a big summit um, to, uh, you know, a sports event to, uh, you know, sort of a, a, a business job. But that also really applies to general photography. If yeah. you don't know why you're photographing something, how can you get the best out of it? Mm. So I like to now understand fully myself and my subject before I even start thinking about a picture because it's only by really paying attention do you get the best out of what you want and then you get something authentic it's very easy to photograph something the same way that other people have done it but to get something that truly represents how you feel about what you're photographing mm. you've got to really understand who you are and what the subject is otherwise you're you're sort of going halfway. No, I get what you mean. Yeah, does that make yeah. sense? No, completely. Never sure if what I say makes sense. <laughs> no, completely. If, if anybody to watching, anyway. if anybody watching doesn't understand a word of what I said, um, please don't email me to ask because I have no idea. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think yeah, I, I I understand it. I think because I'm, I kind of photograph a little bit opposite in that sense. Yeah. That I kind of, for me, the photography is the journey. Not yeah. so much the outcome, I suppose. Yes. I'm discovering, should yeah. you say. Yeah. Um, so it's, I, I get what you're saying. You yeah. kind of need to know why you're photographing. Yeah, what, why I'm, you know, what is it about something that's caught my attention? Mm. Um, and often as photographers, we have a, we have a pre-visualised idea, which is the outcome. Mine rarely get to that mm. because I find the, you know, like you, mm. the journey of discovery is much more fun. Mm. And I think that if you're, if you understand why you're captured by something, why something really takes your attention, then you can explore and let that unfold. Often we miss those tiny, subtle shifts in something because we're not paying full attention to, to the subject. So I, I my my photography is it's more for me of a meditation, than um a process with a definite end goal. Um, and often I'll revisit the same subject, you know, sort of five or six times without making a picture, just looking and, and working with it, sort of turning it around, looking at how the light works, you know, because I do, my favourite genre is still life. That's, even though I'm largely known for doing landscapes, um, the work I shoot as a still, as still life is, is my favourite. By a long way. And it's really minimalist, your work, isn't it, in a sense that it's... Yeah, well, I, I think life is cluttered. Mm. And I like my my subject to be this, the, the star of the show, I guess. And I think it's very easy to to overcomplicate a picture. Mm. It's very easy to, to have too many things going on in the frame that are unnecessary. It's a little bit like sitting in a room trying to listen to your favourite piece of music while reading a book and having a conversation and watching the tv and watching the tv <laughs> they're all going on at the same time and you want to get all that information somehow but none of it makes sense so by stripping it back deciding what you don't need what at that point is irrelevant just leave it out do you think that comes from like the press days as well yeah space was always a premium mm. 
So everything in the frame had to do its job and earn its keep, yeah, if you like. Had to be a reason. Yeah. Um, but I think also the the stripped back side of it comes from, you know, I've made no secret about my kind of up and down mental mm. health battles, and a lot of a lot of noise in the head um, is not conducive to a calm life. No. So no, not at all. <laughs> by by decluttering my head. And the other parts of my life, I find I found that my pictures got more and more decluttered, so they became more and more minim- minimalist. Um, I did go through a phase of photographing nothing, as in going out and photographing, <laughs> but I was always looking for the space in between things, yes, not the subject itself. Um, a lot of Japanese photographers do. They that. do, yeah. And I think if you look at the space between your subject and whatever its relationship to the the rest of the frame is. That's where the interest lies. It's in the gaps, yeah. in the pauses, in the breaks. Um, it's all the little details you normally walk past. Yeah. And, you just think, oh, yeah. Uh, and I, I, I really enjoy it when I see people working like that and they're looking at the subject and then they notice the shapes between mm-hmm. or the spaces between. And that tells a different story and somehow it elevates the picture mm. to be something even more exciting. Um, and I, I really enjoy that side of photography. I think that, you know, exploring the space and people say, I mean, I've said it a million times, but people call it negative space. Yes. I, it's space. It's yes. not, I think negative space is so, it, it's such a negative connotation. It makes it sound like the space isn't doing anything. Mm. But I like the, I, I just think, you know, it's space for me, it's positive space because it yes. allows breathing space, it allows room for the subject to be a star. And it also allows other things to to sort of filter into your uh, perception of the picture. No, definitely. Mm. I think that's yeah. I'm quite a I quite a fan of space. Yeah. Like, a lot of my pictures don't have space, but it's <laughs> it's <laughs> the perception of space. Yeah, perception yeah. of space. I suppose yeah. it was always. I did used to shoot a lot of. You know, I always put the. I, if I photograph people, they're always in a corner somewhere. Yeah. With massive space. Yeah. I know that some people say oh, we should have. A, Subject walking into space. No, my walls are walking out of frame. <laughs> like, the nose on the edge. I think it's just been my life, to be honest. I'm rebelling against Cartier Bresson, but um, <laughs> I think that's just why not. <laughs> that's my, my mission. Yeah. Um, also, why is that? Does it that link to why your work's mostly black and white, and just yeah. taking that colour away and just yeah. decluttering? The I find colour quite disturbing. Colour for me and this is no kind of um this is no slight on anybody out there who's shooting color um but for me i find color is loud it's a bit shouty um and i don't have control over it Mm. i can't i I just have no understanding of how to control my color no and i mean even when i was at you know i briefly went to art college and even there i had no control over color paints couldn't just couldn't make them work Charcoal, absolutely fine. But um, so black and white for me is a way of taking the noise out of the picture. Mm. It's allowing the subject to to speak in a way that it's not normally allowed to speak. Because most people go, oh, wow, that's a fabulous colour, you know, beautiful sunset. Look at the colours or wonderful mm. flower. Look it's how yellow sky. it is. Yeah. Um, whereas when you take that colour away, people have to relate to it in a different way. And I like that stripped back sort of approach where you you take all the information that people are used to away and then they're having to engage with it in a different Mm. way and it makes them stop and it makes them pause and it makes them think and i like that Mm. i think it's quite good to to ask people who are looking at your work questions it's good to challenge them a little bit It's, it's good to you know not just get them to mindlessly click like on something because people don't even see what they're liking no, you know, at the end of most days, you probably can't remember any of the pictures you like on social media. Yeah, what is it? You've got zero point zero three of a second or something. Yeah, and people. Yes, yeah. you know, our attention on. span is like you know, we're less than goldfish now. Yeah, yeah, pretty much. <laughs> and you're gonna go by the name of Bob. <laughs> <laughs> but um, yeah, I think I get what you mean about the the color because mm. I, I've never been that person. I remember when I was doing color printing at, at university and things, and I was just I just didn't get it. No, <laughs> it was just the color wheels and things, yeah. and I was opposite. And 
I still yeah. can't do it now. So yeah. I apologize. Yeah. If anyone watched my videos with the color grading, I do apologize. <laughs> See, but, yeah. but I can appreciate color because to be a black and white photographer, mm. you've got to appreciate color. But you've got to appreciate color and then assess what tone it will reproduce as and where you want that color to be in your tonal range. You know, do you want your reds to be black or do you want them to be light? Do you want the blues to be dark or do you want them to be light? Do you want the greens to be a mid-tone or an extreme tone? And you can control that quite skillfully, you know, these days in Lightroom. But, mm. in, you know, on film, we use colour filters. Um, and I, I think an appreciation of colour in the, the natural world that you photograph is, is a very important thing to have. Mm. So I see colour but I see it as toned, um, you know, but I don't have black and white vision. When you say, when I say to people, oh, I see in black and white, they think I might have a problem with my eyes. You know, I can see colours and appreciate it, but I automatically translate it to a tone, mm. okay. um, which, you know, is, is you something that's practised. Shooting in black and white is kind of, it, it brings it out of reality a little bit. Colours a bit too real. Uh, maybe yeah i've not thought of it like that but I, I think that it's the simplicity of the message in black and white that that gets me i mean color is a bit real and people have a habit of making it hyper real mm. you know by saturation and clarity and hdr and all of those things that sometimes just get a bit a bit much um you know but there are some people whose work i really appreciate who limit their colour palette um, or, you know, they'll literally just be one, but not a, not sort of a spot colour where you remove all but one colour, but there'll be a very a subtle hint of colour. Uh, you know, the whole picture's colour, but there'll be a very subtle, and I quite like that, but I just don't, I can't do it. Um, and I, I, I don't, I don't want to do it. Uh, I think there might come a time in the future where I suddenly decide, you know what, I'm going to start shooting colour but I don't have any inkling to it at the moment plus the fact it's more expensive on ink well and also you've started shooting film again yes <laughs> yeah, I have so, yeah and processing colour film is a lot more difficult yes. than processing black and white trying to find someone who does it yes yeah <laughs> um, yeah yeah I mean the the journey to film um, started 18 months or so ago I guess um, when I came into this office and I was really annoyed with my camera um, because everything was too sharp. Mm -hmm. It was too clean. It was too clear. It was too perfect. And We're not going to say which camera that is, by the way. No, so. <laughs> but it was a medium format digital camera. You can... Um, <laughs> now, the fact that this camera produces such amazing, amazingly sharp images it is a... A success you know it's not it's a bad camera no but uh, i i've grown tired of perfection i think perfection is so boring it's so mundane that actually it can't even be celebrated and i love photographing mundane things i love celebrating the ordinary but perfection is so overrated because it it's a man-made concept mm -hmm. nothing in life is perfect we strive to be perfect you know people have cosmetic surgery we go to the gym we go on diets you know we buy nice clothes we we portray perfection of life in our social media but actually life isn't perfect it's messy yeah it's broken it, it's unruly it, it's you know it's chaotic yeah it's not the i know kind of a genre i'm in with street photography and things i the pools of light yeah they do annoy me. I should, I should say, <laughs> I, I'm not one of those people that can stand there for hours mm. and look for a pool of light, yeah, and things and do that. Um, that's why it's just me, I suppose. Yeah. The chaos yeah. that I am, but, yeah. um, but I know that you quite enjoy that side of things. Yeah, I like the yeah. contemplation of, mm. uh, of space and light. I, you know, I enjoy that. I like the slowing down, and I, I enjoy it because it's very different from what I used to do, mm. which was rushing around with my hair on fire most of the time. <laughs> and I think to spend a bit of time with something is is really, it's quite precious because it allows me to, to step back. Now, you've got quite a young family, mm. so you, 
my family not so young. So I mean, they usually have to come with me. So it's yeah, quite good. <laughs> see that's that's not going to give you room to wait for a pool of light. No, it's not. You know, not three, at all. three kids <laughs> definitely not going to give you room to wait for a pool of light. Having one non photographic partner is enough, but having three kids yeah. is never going to work. <laughs> but for me, I I like going out on my own. I'm not the most social person. Um, I don't like photographing when I'm with other people. You know, it's quality time mm-hmm. with myself. And, and I use photography as part of my sort of self-care thing. You know, that quality of time is time that I can step away from the things that I should be doing and do something that I want to do. And there's a, there's a huge difference between what we feel we should do and what we actually want to do. You know, most of us feel we should go to work to earn money to pay the mortgage, mm. um, unless you're a professional photographer. And then you go to work and you still don't earn enough money to pay the mortgage. <laughs> but the... The idea of should and could, giving yourself the choice, the power of choice. Mm. Um, you know, I, I should be doing that, but I choose to do this. So, and I um, choose to do this because I enjoy it. And I will often go out and I'll put the camera up sometimes and I won't even make a picture. I just enjoy being, mm. you know, not doing. Um, and giving yourself time to be as a, as a photographer, as a creative is really important because that's where your, your ideas filter in. Um, and then they can kind of percolate around a bit and, or they can come along and they can slap you around the face. But by not allowing yourself that time to, to just be, you don't give your ideas time to grow. You don't have the time sometimes or the inclination to, to chase an idea because you know you've got to start at the beginning. And part of the thing about perfection that annoyed me was we all want to be experts. We all want to be the top of our game, but actually the fun happens at the bottom of your game. Because when you're learning a new technique, that's when mistakes happen. That's when you learn about things. That's when you might be inspired to, to go off in a slightly different direction because something went a bit wrong and you think, oh, I like that. Yeah. I know it's gone wrong from where I was hoping it might go, but I really like what, can I reproduce that? How would I go about reproducing that? And that's when it gets exciting. But we all want to get the, you know, the 10 camera club or the, you know, the thousand likes on Instagram mm-hmm. or whatever, or the, you know, the award. And I, I think actually if you if you allow yourself that beginner's mind, that openness, you'll start to see things that you haven't been conditioned to see. Mm-hmm. And seeing is the is the backbone of photography. You know, if you can't see, what can you how can you make a picture? I mean, and I don't mean that in the, the literal visual sense, yeah. but if you can't, you know, sort of really get to grips with what you're photographing, then how, how are you ever going to make any meaningful pictures? And I think it, it's really important that people stop just painting by numbers. Yeah, it is. Uh, I think, yeah, you're right there, because I think you look on Instagram, they're all the same. Yeah. Everything is the same with the same filters, um, or they're saying, "Oh, where's this location? I really want to go and photograph it." Mm. And there's nothing wrong with going to a location or following a subject because we're all inspired by people. Mm. And part of the the rite of passage is learning how those that inspire you worked, and mimicking a little bit of what and they did, and then moving on. Yeah. Um, but a lot of us stay in that place where we know it's safe because we're taking a picture that's been done before. So we know where to go. We know the kit to use, the filters to use. And all we've got to do is maybe time it right so we get the right weather or whatever. And we, we produce a picture that's beautiful. But then what else is there? Yeah, definitely, yeah. You know, what do you feel about what you just saw? Or is it just shutter speeds and apertures to you? You know, how how does it affect you emotionally and spiritually when you make a picture of something? Because that's where the magic is. You know, if you look at the work, I mean, my influences, you know, Minor White, Edward Weston, Sarah Moon, Ansel Adams, Harry Callahan, uh, Man Ray, Bill Brandt, they're all old school photographers. Mm. Um, all very different as well. Yeah. And I've I've made pictures that that match some. I mean, the flower photography 
you know, I draw my inspiration for that partly from Edward Weston, but also from Robert Mapplethorpe. Mm. I was going to say Mapplethorpe. Yeah, I think it's quite. And uh, you know, I love his flower work, but they're not just pictures of flowers. No, they're pictures of his emotions. Yeah, and, and that's <laughs> you know, and and and, and, and the other things, yes. <laughs> but, but yeah, <laughs> and his sort of, you know, fantasies. Um, that's a good word. But, <laughs> But we're frightened of revealing mm. ourselves. Yeah, no, we are definitely. And I think the the longer we go on, the more and more withdrawn we are, the more and more closed off. And only by opening yourself up, being a little bit vulnerable to to things, is is where you start to find your your creative voice. Mm. You know, it's the creative voice isn't in the security. Creative voice is in the insecurity. You know, that we sit in our security blankets, photographing the same thing in the same way, frightened of going, actually, I don't particularly like what I'm photographing. It leaves me a bit cold. Is so, it not rocking the boat? Is it? Yeah, we don't want to rock the boat. Um, you know, and it, I mean, I've just finished working with Landscape Photographer of the Year, mm. which is a, a fabulous competition. But the number of photographs that are taken of the same thing or mimicking the previous winner. Exactly. And you think, surely, somewhere along the line, there is something exciting happening. Now, the nice thing about that competition that I love is the youth competition. Mm. Because the, the under-18s don't shoot to conform. No. They are exciting. They are, they're, you know, they're quite, you know, raw. Uh, and I, I, I like the fact that there's a rawness about the way they work, whereas the adult thing, it's all perfect. Um, you know, and I, I, I applaud the people who can produce these beautiful landscapes. But the ones that excite me are the ones that are of landscapes and ideas that aren't commonly photographed. You know, we can all go up to Glencoe and shoot, I don't know, a whole portfolio of images in Glencoe but they look like everybody else's pictures. Yes. What about going to Glencoe and finding something for yourself? Yeah, do the, do the iconic pictures, but don't make that the reason you go. You know, perhaps it's just an autumn leaf hanging in the breeze. Perhaps it's the way the water cascades over a rapid. You know, maybe it's frost in the puddle. And there are people that, that do shoot those. But I, I think if we say we've been to a certain place, everybody has that picture in their mind and we're worried about disappointing people and letting them down. And while you should care about what people think about your work, you shouldn't be so wedded to what they think that you are hamstrung by it. Um, you know, and it's that idea of being a little bit vulnerable. Um, Brené Brown does a fabulous talk. Uh, she did a TED talk about vulnerability and creativity. Okay well worth listening to it's only about 15 minutes okay right. but it's 15 minutes of absolutely getting to the heart of where vulnerability and creativity fit mm. um but we're frightened of being vulnerable because we yeah. want to be seen as I'll strong try. we'll have to get it and put it in the description yes and, um, good idea yeah it's on uh, it's on youtube okay um but that whole idea of being vulnerable when all of our lives have been conditioned to be strong especially especially men yes yeah you know be strong be the be the breadwinner be the this be the that be the other you know boys don't cry well why not you know it's okay to be vulnerable it's okay to be in touch with your emotional side um and i, I think that's a really important thing to move your photography forward yeah, if definitely. you if the books the book <laughs> this this is only a small amount of the books that i've read mm -hmm. There isn't one of those books that says, as a photographer, you need to be strong. Every single one talks about vulnerability, about empathy, about feeling, um, about the emotional connection with your subject and of often seeing something of you in your subject. And yet we turn our back on all of that to show that we're perfect. Yes, yeah. I okay. think we do, especially on social media and things like that. So. Yeah, exactly. But, um, yeah. Well, I think that's a nice way to draw the part one of this lovely talk. 
Oh, um, I'm really sorry. Too. <laughs> <laughs> so, until next time, don't forget to subscribe to the channel and also sign up to our newsletter. And until next time, um, we'll see you next week. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.